But first, let's go back to New York for a different story. This week marks five years since Superstorm Sandy. It flooded coastline communities and led to tens of billions of dollars of damage. In New York, there are many plans on how to prepare for and withstand the worst of another disaster. But turning those ideas into reality remains a huge challenge. It's the focus of our Leading Edge segment tonight. Miles O'Brien has a report starting off in Queens. On 15th Road in Broad Channel, New York, they're working hard to keep their heads above water five years after Superstorm Sandy barreled in. What they're doing is basically uh, elevating homes and rebuilding homes, all with the idea to get above the 100-year floodplain. New York firefighter Dan Mundy is the third generation of his family to live on this spit of land in the middle of Jamaica Bay, not far from Kennedy Airport. We have a house that's completed here. Uh, this was an elevation. The rest of the house was original house, just lifted up uh, 10 feet in the air, up above, uh, you know, flood elevation. But it has taken a long time to get to this point. The federal money and the myriad of government approvals to raise houses, raise the streets, and build seawalls moved a whole lot slower than the storm. I think everybody thought out of the get-go, you know, we're going to just come in here and do a simple construction project. Um, you're probably standing in the most complicated area in the city of New York to um, build residential homes. Nothing here is simple or cheap. Down Cross Bay Boulevard at Rockaway Beach, I met the city's chief resilience officer, Daniel Zarilli, at the recently completed five and a half mile, $340 million boardwalk, minus the boards. It's been built out of uh, stronger materials, so it's uh, now no longer going to be that projectile that, that can get thrown across the, the neighborhoods here, but we've also integrated it in with our coastal protection. This concrete rampart against a steadily rising, sometimes raging sea is buttressed with sand dunes planted with seagrass. But it is only five and a half out of more than 500 miles of coastline in New York City alone. It's a reminder of the scale of the problem and the challenge of responding to it in an affordable, timely way. The dollars don't show up when the storm shows up. And so, uh, you know, it took three months for Congress to decide that they wanted to help the New York region. It took another two years to allocate the funds, and now we're in the process of spending that money. They are pushing plans to build flood walls and other hard barriers in Lower Manhattan, East Harlem, at Hunts Point in the Bronx, in the Red Hook section of Brooklyn, and in Staten Island. Dunes and bulkheads have been upgraded, but no concrete has been poured for the more complex projects. Meanwhile, the utilities have done some work. Verizon replaced its copper phone wires in Lower Manhattan with fiber optic cables. And the electric utility, Consolidated Edison, has fortified the Manhattan power plant that flooded and failed in spectacular fashion. And has protected underground lines elsewhere, spending $1 billion. This is resiliency in action. Bill de Blasio is New York City's mayor. Is New York City better prepared for a superstorm than it was five years ago? Yes, and we we'll take this very seriously. Let's face it, uh, Sandy was the ultimate wake-up call for New York City as the worst natural disaster in our history, and we're still feeling the effects. So we had to change the way we did things. We're a very different city. We still have major issues to address, but we're a very different city today. While private homeowners are now finally making improvements, many people in public housing are still waiting for the work to begin. A lot of the issues that are going on here in East River Housing are not being addressed. Carmen Williams is a longtime resident of the East River Homes in Spanish Harlem. The layout for what we saw, it looks good on paper, but that's not going to help us. Right. We need the work to actually be done. The Federal Emergency Management Agency earmarked $3 billion for flood mitigation improvements to New York City public housing. The promised work here includes floodgates and moving the boilers higher. Sandy filled the courtyard where we met with knee-deep water. You guys are just as uh, vulnerable as you were five years ago, you think? I think so right now because it, it's not completed. So if it's not completed and we don't know where we're at, yeah. 
we feel just as vulnerable as we did then. Community organizer Cecil Corbin Mark is concerned about delays in the East Harlem flood protection project. It was a physical infrastructure project that was supposed to be completed by last year. It still hasn't been done. And I don't give the city good marks for that because that means that with the next event, um, that East Harlem residents uh, on the, along First Avenue on the Harlem River Drive corridor could be seeing floodwaters at their doorsteps and beyond uh, again, and that's not acceptable. Climate change is not a say hey, ho, ho. That frustration welled up on Saturday as hundreds of protesters staged a rally at the Brooklyn Bridge, hoping to spur action on the threat posed by climate change, which could spur another superstorm. We're asking the mayor and the governor to get on it now. We don't have time to waste. Since Sandy, engineers, environmentalists, and politicians have spent a lot of time debating the merits of building a massive harbor-wide storm surge barrier modeled after the huge project that protects the Netherlands from the North Sea. It would take decades and cost tens of billions of dollars. I'm very interested in it. If there's a way to do it, it might be one of the better solutions, but I know I can't wait for it. So I think we end up recognizing we've got to take all the actions we can to here and now. And here and now looks a lot more green than gray. Dan Mundy knows a lot about this. We're in the middle of Jamaica Bay, and we're going out to uh, the most recently restored wetland island. In 2013, he led a community effort to rebuild some of the islands of Jamaica Bay that he remembered from his younger days. Discharges from sewage treatment plants had polluted the bay, killing the marsh grass. The islands got swallowed up by the water. We were looking to restore these islands, and we used the old footprint of where they were before they were degraded, and got together with partners like the National Park Service. Mundy's two islands are now flourishing here. He hopes to build more. Scientists concluded natural wetlands prevented $625 million in sandy-related flood damage from Maine to North Carolina. It's nature's speed bump. New York City faces its own hurdles as it looks to build out the defenses it envisions. Once it finishes its $20 billion plan using city and federal money, there is no more resiliency funding for New York in the pipeline from Washington. My fear is in the absence of a federal policy, it ends up being a catch-as-catch-can approach. And the jurisdictions that are more focused will get more done, and the jurisdictions that have proportionally more resources will get more done, and others will be left very, very vulnerable. Those vulnerabilities have been highlighted again and again this hurricane season in Houston, Florida, and Puerto Rico. Many predicted Superstorm Sandy would trigger us to harden our infrastructure, and perhaps in some cases retreat from the water. But the pull of this special place is strong for people like Dan Mundy. You guys aren't retreating, are you? No, there's a strong opinion about that down here. These are generations of families that have lived down here. They love the water. Uh, we know we have, we're at risk. We'll take the risk. Uh, we're willing to take it. With the help of taxpayer-subsidized flood insurance, of course. Five years after Superstorm Sandy, New Yorkers are determined to hold their ground against a rising tide of water and ebbing interest in Washington to join the fight. In New York, I'm Miles O'Brien for the PBS NewsHour.